little more. Whoa, a little more. Hello, this is Peter. <laughs> For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Now, what Jesus is saying is you better count the cost because you don't start a project and then not be able to complete it. You don't become my follower and quit halfway. You better count the cost to follow me. Because guess what? It did then, and it will now. It will cost you everything. And if following Jesus hasn't cost you something today, according to the Bible, you're not doing it right. That's not me. I know you want to be mad at me for saying that. I'm just telling you what God's Word said. It's going to cost you. What has it cost you? Now, we live in a great country where we have tremendous freedoms and rights. So, yes, it's a little harder in America as it is in China. You get caught with a page of the Bible, you're probably going to get beat and thrown in jail. So I recognize because of the servicemen and women of this country, we have some freedoms that we neglect as Christians. We don't even read our Bibles. Now, I'm not trying to shame you tonight, but who brought their Bible? We don't even bring our Bibles to church anymore. We're so accustomed that we just take it for granted. Mm. Almost done. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet great 
what, great far off, will send delegates and ask for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Why aren't we preaching that anymore? That's from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And that is not, hey, bro, God loves you. He's got a wonderful plan for you. That is not the gospel. I don't know what that is. It's garbage. And it's sending people to hell who think they know God, but they just worship themselves. Tone it down, Peter. Tone it down. It just, it angers me. It angers me. We don't, I, we don't know the Word of God. We don't know our Bible. And when you don't know the Bible, remember what I told you about the counterfeits and, at the FBI? How many $100 bills did they study? One! The right one! They don't study all the different counterfeits. If you know what the right $100 looks like, you'll know the counterfeits. And I'm sorry, I know I'm packed, and my wife might say I'm getting dogmatic, so I need to back off. We don't know the Word of God. We d People, it's work to be a Christian. It ain't easy. If it's easy, you're doing it wrong. I'm just telling you now why well, there's time. There's time to say, Lord, get me on the right path. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Matthew 7, we'll get to it, and many find it. Narrow is the path that leads to righteousness, that leads to life, and few find it. Now, how many is many, and how many is few? You think about that, and you know how he concludes that? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. People, I'm just trying to warn you. That is my job as a shepherd. Do not come up to Jesus on your day and say, Lord. And he go, who are you talking to? Because it ain't me. Are you worshiping the right God? It ain't Skittles and rainbows, because if it is, you've got the wrong God. We are sojourners on this world. This is not our home. I'm not looking forward to death, but I'm ready to die. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not looking forward to it, but I'm ready. I, I pray the Lord will give me a few more days, but if he chooses not to, I'm ready. We got to know the word, people. Get in the word. That's the truth. Jesus said in John 17, your word is truth. Everything that comes out of my mouth, you better think, where is he getting that in God's word? Every single thing. If I tell a joke, you better be matching it up with this. Does that match up with scripture? Otherwise, I'm just a Pied Piper and got a pretty flute. That's my warning. I just want to warn you because Jesus warned his people. He told them to be careful. Man said, I, I want to follow you, Jesus, but let me go bury my dad first. Jesus said, no, nah, no follower of mine. Let the dead bury the dead. Let me go help my dad plow the field. Hey. Once you lay your hand on the plow, don't ever look back. That ain't the sinner's prayer. Well, just pray this prayer with me. Lord, come into my heart. Amen. You're a follower. I don't see Jesus ever doing that. I don't see Paul ever doing that. He preached repentance and salvation. The gospel is you don't deserve it. Jesus did it for you. Follow him. That's the gospel. The bad news comes before the good news. What's, who, what's good's the good news if there's no bad news? You know? It's not the gospel without bad news.
Any comments or questions? Sorry, that, I know I get passionate, and I apologize that startled you, Laurel. Sorry if you're a first-time visitor or so, well, member. <laughs> I just get passionate. Any, any comments? Am I right or wrong? I mean, I'm not sure if you guys are. Okay, okay. I'm just like, oh, am I have a deacon's meeting after this? Or are you, are you guys like, okay. Yeah. See, that's the question. And that's, you know, if you prayed the sinner's prayer, my wife walked an aisle, but I see fruit under her tree. You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm not poo pooing walking the aisle or the sinner's prayer. I'm just saying, I know a lot of people who say, I prayed the sinner's prayer, and then they live like hell the rest of their life and just don't add up for me. I'm like, something ain't right here. Something ain't right. So I'm just saying we need to make sure we're right with the God, not the biblical God, because people tell me all the time about the God they worship, and I go, I know you worship that God. You need to repent and worship the biblical God. I say it with love, but you got to warn people. You're not following the biblical God. All right, no comments? Okay, <laughs> we'll get to it, to uh, Acts. So as... as uh, Chapter 1, what happened in chapter 1? Real quick, somebody, Acts 1, Jesus ascends, that's right, Jesus says wait, wait for the Holy Spirit, wait on the helper, and what do they do in the meantime? Remember they did something, 12, that's right, they replaced Judas, now who did that? Who kind of led that? Peter. Had some scripture. That's good. Peter was in the word. Now the Holy Spirit's come. That's the Holy Spirit. That's not wind. That's the Holy Spirit. Sounds like wind. So the Holy Spirit comes and empowers these 120 men. Don't forget, the church started, I mean, technically it started with 12, started with one, then 12, then 120. And by the end of Acts, we see the gospel going out to the known world at that time. Amazing. So keep that in mind. 120 people and what they did in the span of 30, 40 years. Amazing people. There's, you have no clue how powerful the Holy Spirit in you is. It's pretty amazing. And might I remind you, as I see some older eyes looking at me, Abraham, Moses, did some of their best work after the age of 80. Man, I'm rooting for you guys. Rooting hard for you. Rooting hard. Rooting hard. Okay. So we are, you'll see you'll have two pages. We're not, I won't read all of this, but Peter will stand up, and he will preach the great, well, the second greatest sermon, the greatest sermon, is, we're going through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, but the second greatest sermon, <laughs> Peter's getting ready to preach. And mom, would you read Acts chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 8? So, the 120 received the Holy Spirit, let's call them power, that power, that ability to, to, to well, they were making Scripture, but to, to read Scripture. You don't understand Scripture without the Holy Spirit. So, for us to go to a non-believer and start pushing the law on them is futile. 
I mean, because they don't have the Holy Spirit, so it's not going to mean much to them. You know, they're out for themselves. So that's why we got to start with the, the bad news. Hey, God requires perfection to get to heaven. And I can't be perfect, and neither can you. And that's where Jesus comes in. He, he was perfect, and you can get a piece of that perfection by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. So you have that power now. So when we read Peter, and we're all inspired by Peter, right? I mean, everybody's like, woo, Peter's the man. That's you too. He don't have an extra dose of the Holy Spirit. He's got the Holy Spirit just like you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. So you might start, you might want to start doing some Holy Spirit things. I mean, there's amazing things. Jesus said you can move mountains. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. That's you. Let's get to work. <laughs> we just talked about work. Let's get to work. So, so Peter is going to, and that's what I love about Peter. You, he never one time. Scan the Gospels. Study them hard. Peter, at never one time does he quote scriptures in the Gospels. Never. He's quoting scriptures all the time now. He's going to quote Joel. This here is first. Joel from 17 to 21. And Joel, remember Joel? Prophet Joel? He's a minor prophet. Is he a minor prophet because he was little like Zacchaeus? No, he's a minor prophet. The minor prophets, 12 and the minor prophets, they're just really short books. They had really one goal, which was to warn Israel. Hey, Israel, you better get your, you know, get it back in, together because you're going down the wrong road. So, you know, Joel was to warn Israel because the Babylonians were coming. And he was to warn Israel, quit worshiping false idols. And if you read 17 through 21, it's actually two different prophecy. Joel prophesizes about the Holy Spirit, but then also he prophesizes about end times. So they're kind of conflated, because for a Jew, you know, we're in the, uh, the dispensation of grace, so the Jews are not really not able to see us because we're in the valley. The church is in that valley, so they can see Christ, and then they can see end times, but they can't see in the valley, and that's the church because we know, Corinthians tells us, the devil has blinded the Jews. So they just do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You all understand that, don't you? They just, they just don't accept him. And if you've ever talked to Jews, they just don't get it. I mean, they don't get it. They're like, yeah. How do you see him as Messiah? Messiah's going to come back like David, a mighty king. Well, yeah, in the second coming. Jesus is going to come back like a king when he comes in Revelation. But he came like a servant the first time. They just missed it because they didn't know Scripture. So just FYI. Because now Peter's showing us through Scripture, hey, what's going on? So he quotes Joel and then he quotes a couple psalms when David was uh, uh, talking about the Lord would put them under his enemies under his feet. So let's look at verse 17. We'll jump up to 16. Peter's talking. What he's doing is answering the crowd. If you'll go back and read verse 13, they're asking, what's this all about? Are y'all drunk? And so Peter answers, no, we're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock. It's only 9 in the morning. It's only the third hour. That's how they kept time. And then it says, verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. You'll read in the New Testament and Old, the last days. Don't be confused by the last days. What that means is the time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. So we are in the last days. A thousand years ago, they were in the last days. A thousand years from now, <coughs> I'm losing my voice, they will be in the last days. So don't be confused by last days. It's not necessarily talking about end times prophecy. It's talking about the dispensation of grace. 
the last days. And we are in the last days. We are one day closer. I can't tell you when it will be, but we are one day closer to the end times. And tomorrow we're going to be another day closer. So, I mean, can't wait. I want to get people saved, but I also want to see the end times. I want to see Jesus reign and rule on this earth. A new heaven, a new earth. Can't wait for it. Hope you can't either. So he's going down, he's going down. So 17 to 21 is Joel. Then he's saying, oh, men, uh, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of, ye, of you, as ye yourselves also know. They, they saw the miracles, wonders, and signs. He, he didn't have to name any. They saw them. You know, Jesus resurrected 50 days ago. That's when Pentecost is. Remember we talked about the, the weeks? Pentecost was the seven-week period. Y'all remember that? Just nod your heads even if you don't remember. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. <clears throat> uh, da, da, da. You also knew him by delivering by the, by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up, God approved of Jesus' sacrifice, his death on the cross, and he raised him up as his approval. Yes, you've done. You have fulfilled all that I've required. You have done it. And now death has, where is your victory? Oh, death, death has no sting. So Jesus rises from the dead. So technically, you and I, if we are in Christ, we will never taste death. Yes, our bodies will die, but we will not. So a Christian will never, there is no second death for us. We will live forever, basically. We're going to live, for, and so will the people go to hell. That They're going to live forever, but they're going to live in death. I mean, it's not, it's the second death, the Bible calls it. And then he says in verse 29, in verse 25, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did, did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Uh, thou hast made known to him, known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with my countenance. So he is basically going through the gospel here. And then he goes on, men and brethren, let, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and the sepulcher is with us today. His grave is with us today. Jesus has no grave because he has no bones. He has no body. He's risen from the grave. There's an empty tomb. Uh, Joseph of Ar Ar Arimathea. Now, thir 32, this Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we also witness, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, who hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into heaven, heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit, at, sit thou my right hand until I take my, until thy foes thy footstool, until I make thy foes thy enemies a footstool. So basically what Peter is saying here is what David was saying in the Psalms, that David knew that the son of David would be the Savior and not his actual birth son, but would be God's Messiah. So he's basically saying, the Lord said unto my Lord. So that's basically calling the Messiah God. You understand that? If Jesus wasn't God in the flesh, he could not live our life die our death, and then raise from the dead. Jesus has to be God to do that. So when you confront a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, just tell them, bless you, Charlie, say, I'm confused because how can a mere man be perfect, die, and raise from the grave? It just can't happen unless he is God in flesh. 
Now, they'll try to tell you and use Bible verses, but just keep saying, no, no, that's not right. That's not right. Jesus is God in the flesh. Just stay on that. That's biblical. Jesus is God. It's the triune God. So Jesus has to be God. Or these things wouldn't be possible. I mean, all men are born that are born of flesh ha- just have a sin nature to us. Christ did not, but yet was tempted in every way. Can you imagine that? I just can't fathom that. That he was tempted the way I was and was able to, mm, to not do it in his mind. That's, that's just amazing to me. He was perfect. And that's what God requires. Perfection. So I'm just trying to get to these questions. Um, so any questions about that? We, we're only... Because we, we, here's Peter's sermon. And then next, next Wednesday we're going to see the crowd's response. So we're going to see a lot of people get saved. We're going to see the church start really growing. And all Peter did, take this home and read it, is preach the gospel. I mean, he preached basically the Old Testament. <clears throat> the gospel in the Old Testament, that's pretty awesome. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. So <coughs> It's not getting as manly. It's, it's weak now. <laughs> so. so what time was it when Peter delivered this sermon? 9 a.m., I already told you all that. Y'all, y'all got to be smart now, okay? 9, it was early in the morning. He was probably at the temple. He's probably at the temple at the same steps that Jesus taught many of his parables and lessons. Well, Solomon's portico, Solomon's portico is that round area. He could have been. He could have been inside and it could be. We, we really don't know. There's the steps, and then you get into Solomon's portico. It's called portico. I guess you could call it a porch, but it's these round columns that are kind of protected from the, you know, they got a little shade there, the portico. He, he could have been there speaking out into the, you know, the Gentiles and the, and the Jews. They had their own sections. He could have because it was 3,000 people. That's a lot of people. So he very likely could have, but he was at the temple somewhere. He was at the temple. The same place where the sacrifices were, were held. So uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, what was the source of Peter's boldness? Again, I told you that. There you go. Did y'all hear Steve? The Holy Spirit. Your power, you are nothing without the Holy Spirit. Okay, y'all understand that? You get your power, your courage, everything from the, you get your knowledge of the, of the Word from the Holy Spirit. It's a person. He's a person. He's a real person living in you. I can't, can't really explain it. I just know what the Bible says. He's a person in you. Same, the same one in Peter. The same one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yes, 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 and, and, and I'm not trying to be ugly here, but you have the same experience, Sharon. Every Christian has a, you have a past, you have a testimony, I once was lost, and then I was saved, you have experience, you, whether you knew it or not, you were an enemy of God until you became saved. An enemy. Read Romans, Romans 3 and 4. You were an enemy of God. And you got saved, and then you have a testimony. So you, the same thing, and I'm with you. Peter has a phenomenal story. I mean, here's a little schoolgirl saying, I know you. You're one of them. No, I'm not. And he runs away. And what did he tell Jesus three hours before? Bucked up his chest. I will never, ever leave you. And then he runs like a, like a, feminine person in three hours you can't say girl anymore mom gets on me so he wants like a weakling but think about that that's the story and we're all we all got the same story how many of y'all have tried to buck up and then you were just destroyed by someone else's comment and when you run i ran 
I did too. I still do sometimes in, in discussions. I'm like, Dad, come, this guy knows what he's talking about. I mean, we all have the same story, but we got the Holy Spirit. I just get in the way too much. I'm telling you, I get in the way too much. I just don't let the Holy Spirit work through me. I get, I'm get, i serious. I, I, my, my flesh gets in the way, and I beat myself up over it, and I go, don't do that again. Let the Holy Spirit go. Let that love, we do it in love. Everything we do, we do in love. Okay, doing love, compassion, and sincerity. We don't want this person going to hell. Okay. What was Peter's message to the crowd? The gospel. Basically, the gospel. Repent and believe. Okay, great question. Who crucified Jesus according to Peter in Acts 2.23? Let's see. Let's see if you're right. Him being delivered and by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. So men took him, but God foreknew and ordained his death. Determined counsel and foreknowledge. So did God kill Jesus? Or did man kill Jesus? Both. I think God used man. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yes, you're right. God, you, but the, he uses us today. But, yeah, but both. Jesus had to die. That was the plan from the begin Genesis 1, the plan. Jesus wasn't plan B. You all understand that? The devil tricked Eve, and God went, oh, man, what? Oh, I have to come up with plan B now. It was, it was plan A the whole time. Remember, Jesus is God. So Jesus wasn't an innocent. It's God. That's his plan. It's him. And I know it's getting, away, you know, it's getting a little bit deep now. I don't even comprehend it. But God didn't kill, I mean, God did kill Jesus, but it was God in the flesh. Triune, three persons, one being. Three persons, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, God. One being, three persons. You got it? Three persons in one being. You'll forget that when you walk out of here, but that's, that it, it is, the Trinity is a hard doctrine. I am still studying it. And haven't fully grasped it. I got a much better handle on it. But it is a deep, it is deep. You start thinking about that and your head will start spinning. When I teach they take the Bible school, sometimes they'll ask me, does this Trinity in it? They'll say ten of these books. <laughs> Form, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's and that's a good concept. Yes, yes, it's a good start. I will definitely agree with you there. It's we, but we, you know, there. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is one being in three persons. But uh, yes. So when people say, well, who killed, you know, did Romans kill God? Did, I mean, Jesus, did the Jews kill Jesus? Did God kill Jesus? Just say yes. Because the Jews did kill him. The Romans did kill him. You would have killed him if you were living then. You did kill him. Jesus had to die to save your soul. So, yes, you killed him anyway. Because if he didn't die, we're all going to hell. We are all going to hell. Well, I thought Jesus lived our perfect life. Read Romans 6. The penalty of sin is death. Somebody got to die. Somebody got to pay for those sins. Somebody got to pay for your wretchedness. Look, three fingers pointing back. I always want to remember that as I point. I'm the three pointing back to me. So just remember that. Yeah. Any questions? I know we're not. We're on time. So I'm. Any questions? I know I threw a lot out at you. So what? Remember, Paul gets converted when Acts. Nine, Acts nine, 
So we will shift, we'll shift from the Jews. I think Peter goes to Cornelius' house at 10 because, you know, uh, Paul and Jesus got to get away for a couple years to, to fill him in, and then, uh, and, then we, and then we go back. We start with the uh, journeys of Paul. So about 12 or 13, we're going to go to Gentiles. So we're going to do, you know, 12 chapters of Jews, Peter, John, getting thrown in jail, and then we jump to Paul at about 12, 13. We'll be Gentiles in the, outer, in the, in the known world. Any questions? So it will be the second part of Acts 2 next week, and then the last part, the third week. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord. We thank you for the word. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be open, that we would meditate on these words, Lord, that we would realize what a, what a great God you are, what a loving and merciful and graceful God you are, what a forgiving God you are to send your Son so that you could have a relationship with us. May we never, ever forget that, Lord. And may that be what just spurs us on to be the ambassadors you ask us to be. Lord, may we, may we prove to be good workmen for you. And Lord, I pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, thank you.